pray that all that we do will bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you can be seated. And of course, cover your, light, cover your eyes as the lights come back on. And open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> on behalf of Edwin and, and uh, Luis, thank you so much for uh, what you did for us. Uh, you know I don't like these kind of things, so it's, but it's more enjoyable when it's other people being recognized and uh, not, just, uh, not just myself. But, uh, you know, the one thing that I've never doubted during my, all my many, many years here and all the people that have come and gone through our church, the one thing I never doubted is that I was loved uh, by the church. And I think um, there's a lot of pastors who can't say that, that uh, over, you know, 30 plus years, they still feel like that uh, the church supports them and encourages them and loves them. And so I say thank you for me personally. Uh, but also uh, on behalf of Edwin and Louise as well. Uh, thank you so much just um, for demonstrating. You know, I hate that my birthday and pastor appreciation are like in the same uh, time frame, but, um, but that's just the way it happens, I guess. This morning I want to share, I really had a hard time all week, um, you know, deciding how to put this together uh, that I just want to talk with you about. And so I simply just wrote down a couple um, yellow sticky notes, and um, and just kind of going from there, and uh, and we'll see. Uh, hopefully, this will make sense. And so, there's nothing on the screen. Um, when I, there are some points I want to make, and I'll tell you those points slowly. So, if you want to write them down, you can. Uh, but uh, but outside of that, this may be a little bit different than um, than a normal uh, message. And really, where it comes from is just some things that have been going on recently. And there's some things that people have been asking me about. Um, you, you know, uh, this past Thursday I spoke about um, Christian nationalism and evangelicalism within the, um, at, well, at the Nashville chapter of the Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which when I was growing up, that would have been like taboo. You don't go speak to that group. They're, they're pagan, you know, kind of almost. But, uh, uh, but that's not how I see it anymore. And um, I know many of you tried to get on online it was um it was supposed to be on zoom and it was if you got the second link but um so but i know a lot of people that wanted to get online weren't able to get online but it was recorded and this morning they sent me the recording of it so i'll get that up on our youtube page uh sometime this week if you're still interested in hearing that and then of course leading up to that um you know i was in my office one day and got a and got a message from Phil Williams on Channel 5 News, and you never know if that's a good thing or a bad thing with Phil Williams uh, contacting you. Um, and uh, he wanted to talk to me about mainly the elections going on in Franklin and how Christian nationalism played into that. Um, over the last four or five years, I've done several interviews and um, uh, here and in other countries even that have contacted me, wanted me to talk about that. But one of the things that always comes up in, in those conversations is this idea of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is Matthew's uh, terminology for it. But it's the same thing. Kingdom, so if I say kingdom of God, if I say kingdom of heaven, I mean the same thing. And that always comes up because <clears throat> um, basically any Christian <laughs> worth their salt understands that our job as followers of Jesus is to bring the kingdom of God into reality in our world. That's just the way it is. Jesus said after he was baptized... Um, you know, repent, um, or you know, um, the kingdom. He said, "The kingdom of God is near," which really meant it is available right now. It's here. Repent and believe the good news. And so, the gospel, which is where the the English phrase "good news" comes from, is the uh, uh, is the Greek word evangelium, and it became gospel. Now, we always associate the gospel with this message that you put, you ask Christ into your life, and that is part of the gospel. But in Jesus' own words. The very first time the word gospel was used in the New Testament, it was in relationship to God's kingdom. The kingdom is here. Repent and believe the good news, um, the, the gospel, the evangelium, the, this call. And so it has something to do with, the gospel has something to do with God's kingdom. And the gospel is what, um, or the kingdom of God is what all the New Testament is about. It's all that Jesus taught. And there's an amazing verse in Acts that I think we overlook sometimes, but in Acts chapter 1, 
Um, after Jesus had risen from the dead, he spent uh, 40 days with his disciples. And in Acts chapter 1, Luke tells us that during those 40 days, Jesus taught them. And you would think that in those 40 days before Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, so between his resurrection and ascension, you would think that what Jesus taught his disciples would be the most important thing. And, and Luke tells us that he taught them things concerning the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of God is the most important thing that as followers of Jesus we are to proclaim. And again, every believer believes that we are to bring the kingdom of God into reality because Jesus brought the kingdom of God with him. The problem is, how, or the, the difficulty becomes, how do you do that? And one way of thought, and this is Christian nationalism, believes that the way you bring God's kingdom into reality is through the power of the state. In other words, you, you pass laws, you pass regulations that favor a particular brand of Christianity, which is a narrow conservative type, and you do it through force, you do it through intimidation, you do it through fear, you do it however you want to because God has given the mandate to dominate the world um, uh, through, through bringing the kingdom of God through education, through government, through entertainment, um, through science, through uh, all those things, seven of them that they usually dwell on. But that's not, that doesn't seem to me what the Bible teaches. It seems like to me that what Jesus says is that we bring God's kingdom into existence not through fear and intimidation and force, but through love, through sacrificial service to others, through forgiveness, um, and and, and because the purpose of the gospel is freedom and liberation, not more bondage. And history has taught us anyway that any time a government gets in bed with the church or the church gets in bed, somebody told me this after the meeting Thursday night. <laughs> I hope I get this right. He said, you know, someone once said, so now he was telling me, that any time the church and the government get in bed together, the church gets pregnant and the child looks nothing like the father. Now think that through, you know. And so instead of fear and intimidation, it's this love, it's this sacrifice, it's this service, it's this, it's this giving, thing, giving ourselves away to other people. The way that the kingdom of God is brought into existence is by, by Jesus tells us in the, uh, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, um, is through uh, clothing those who have no clothes, house, housing those who have no a house, feeding those who have no food, visiting the prisoner, taking care of the sick, those kind of things. That is how the kingdom of God is brought in to existence. And so with that in mind, one of this passage of scripture that I want to share with you today is something that I've just kind of been reflecting on and I've referred to it in most every conversation about Christian nationalism, but I just, want, I don't want to talk about Christian nationalism, I want to talk about the kingdom of God this morning. And in, in Matthew chapter 13, beginning in, verse, beginning in verse 24, Jesus really outlines eight, he gives us eight illustrations about the kingdom of heaven. And so there's no single definition. These are just kind of illustrations that Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And then I, I, I'm trying to draw principles, eight principles from those eight illustrations but I'm also I'm trying to change my language a little bit um, and instead of saying kingdom of God say kingdom of God k-i-n-d-o-m I'm not changing what scripture says but I'm trying to get to the attitude behind what Jesus is really meaning because it's the idea of kinship we want uh, the kingdom of God is a better world in this world where everyone is treated equally the kingdom of God is when what Christ what God wants done on earth or what God wants done in heaven is done on earth which was Jesus prayer Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so really, this, it's this idea of kinship. It's this idea that we're all one family. We're all children of God, and this is the kingdom of God where everyone is treated equally. Or as Dr. King would refer to it as the beloved community. The beloved community. And so if I say kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, I mean the same thing. If I say kingdom of God and kingdom of God, I'm still meaning the same thing. All right, so with that in mind, let's look at Matthew 13 and look at these eight different parables um, that we have here. Uh, someone reminded me this morning because I said I don't have a PowerPoint, um, but I have eight points. And, um, and they said, 
from a joke I told, you know, with a lot of bull in the middle. Uh, and I said, well, no, it's more than two points. It's, so this is more like a, a, a deer. It's got eight points um, with, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of two. But anyway, so he starts with this parable. Now, in verse 24, Jesus says, Jesus told them another parable, which means there was a parable before this one. And the parable before this one that started in 13, verse 1, is the parable of the sower and sowing the seeds, and some fall on good ground, some on hollow ground, some on worse ground, that, that, uh, that parable. And it had to do with how, how people receive, basically, the message of the kingdom of God. And so he says in verse 24, Jesus told them another parable, and here, and here it goes. You'll see this phrase over and over again in the rest of the chapter. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up, you know, pull the weeds out of the wheat? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in a bundle to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now, later on, Jesus is going to give another parable that's somewhat similar to that. The metaphors are different, but the... the but the message is somewhat similar. And so a few months back, I preached just on that parable itself. But I really want to focus in on, here's the parable, and I want to focus in on really the last part, where basically Jesus said, this is the kingdom of heaven. It's being spread like seeds in the world. It started when Christ came. But over time, this wheat, the, the, the weeds have started to grow up with the, with the wheat. Now, what the uh, farmer's workers wanted to do was go right away and try to weed, de-weed the field and pull out the weeds. And Jesus said, no, if you do that, you might also inadvertently pull up the wheat. Now, by way of analogy or by way of illustration, I think that means, you know what, as Christians, we're not to go around trying to judge the world and trying to say, this is right, this is wrong, this person is, 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 is guilty, this person is sinful, this person isn't. Because in a sense, that's pulling up the weeds. And when we do that, when we become overjudgmental because we're trying to pull up the weeds, what happens? We turn other people away from Christ. And so the wheat gets damaged. But what the parable says, what Jesus says in the parable is, look, just let the weeds and the wheat grow together. Then on the day of harvest, and so here's that time in the future, or however you want to look at that. During that day of harvest, God will separate. The wheat from the weeds. It's not our job to separate the wheat from the weeds. It's God's job. And so we're not in the weed pulling business. Rather, we are to be in the cultivating business, you see. But now here's the lesson, the first application. So, so what did Jesus mean in this parable? What, what is he trying to illustrate about God's kingdom? And here it is if you want to write this down. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is both now and not yet. That's the first lesson. The kingdom of God is both now and not yet. In other words, the kingdom of God started when Christ came. And so as we live our lives and as we uh, reach out to other people and as we try to serve the people in the margins of society and clothe the naked and house the homeless and visit the prisoner and do all those things, we are showing the world there's another way to live and this is what the kingdom of God looks like. It's a snapshot of that day when Jesus returns, when everything is made right and there is no more inequality and everyone is treated equally. But until that day comes, here is what we are to do. And so the kingdom is both now, we've got the wheat going on, but there's also weeds growing up, but it's not yet. The kingdom of God started when Christ came to this earth, but it hasn't yet reached fulfillment. It'll reach fulfillment when he returns. And when he returns, it will be in glory and honor. I don't think what you're hearing a lot today in the news, which is based on Zionism, which is heretical teaching, 
this idea, and I've heard some preachers over the last few, few weeks say something like this, that they can't wait for Jesus to return because when he comes, he's going to come with a vengeance and he's going to slaughter all those people who don't believe in him. Well, I'm telling you why I don't believe that. God is a God of love and he's got a grace and he's going to separate but somehow or another, it's restorative and not judgmental. Somehow or another. And so the kingdom of God is now and not yet. But then he goes on. Ver verse 31. He then told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Now, I could go into detail about how small a mustard seed is, but let's just say it's small. <laughs> you know. But yet, when it flourishes, it becomes, you know, as children, we were idea of this big tree, and it's really just a, a really, really big bush. Um, but animals can find comfort in that and find safety and find security. And so this little bitty seed becomes a place of rest, becomes a place of shade, becomes a place of protection for all those around it. It's small, but then it grows into something big. And Jesus says that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. So what, that, what does that mean? The first parable is the kingdom is now and not yet. But here I think is at least part of what Jesus is getting at. And that is this. The kingdom of heaven is bigger and broader than you realize. I mean, you know, if the kingdom of heaven just consisted of us in this gymnasium this morning, I'd be pretty discouraged, right? But the kingdom of heaven is all over the place. You see, you know, in a sense, what's the, what's the quote that uh, Mr. Rogers used to say that he said his mom told him when there, was, when there was disaster going on, you look for the people who are helping because that's where God is? And if you think about that, that's what's going on all over the world. You've got people in the Middle East who are trying to, to protect the children on both the Israeli side and the Gaza side. That is the kingdom of God at work. You may not recognize it, but here's this, it's, it's big. And we may seem insignificant, right? Just us here in this room. But our influence and, and, and what we do reaches far beyond just, just us. That's how the kingdom of God works. It looks like a little mustard seed, but yet when it comes to fruition, it's the, one of the biggest plants in the garden, and it's a place for safety. It's a place for shade. It's a place for protection where people can come. You see? And so the kingdom of God is bigger and broader. Somebody asked me a question Thursday night, and, I, and my answer is something like this. You know, I just kind of see my role. I mean, I come from a conservative background, but I just kind of see my role now where I want to be vocal to let other people know there is another view of Christianity than what the world is seeing on the news. There's another way to follow Christ in a way that is attractive instead of repugnant. So the kingdom of God is bigger and broader than you realize. Kind of following that same path, let's go on in verse 33. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. The kingdom of God does not come about through force, through intimidation, through beating people over the head with the Bible, but rather it's like a little bit of yeast that's put into a lot of dough and then works its way through it almost unseen. And so we're the yeast. We're not the yeast infection. We're just the yeast. 
and we are just to do what God has called us to do. And as we do that in a world that is far, uh, you know, has a lot of, a lot of flower. <laughs> but somehow or another, as we continue uh, to to talk about the kingdom of God and do good works, we are changing the atmosphere around us. We may not see it at work right now, but it is affecting all that we come into contact with. And so here's the lesson behind that, the third lesson. The kingdom the kingdom of heaven is seemingly insignificant but incredibly influential. The kingdom of heaven is seemingly insignificant, but incredibly influential. In verses 36 through 43, um, Jesus, the, the disciples come to Jesus and ask him to explain the parable of the weeds in the field. And so Jesus does that in those verses. I'm not going to read those verses because I've already talked about it, but he explains that first parable we looked at today. And then in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had so he could buy the field. So, you know, he didn't want to just steal it. Right? I mean, you know, he couldn't just take the treasure because that wasn't his property. Now, it seems, still seems a little bit underhanded, but, you know, that's not Jesus' point. He's just telling, a, it's just a metaphor he's using, so don't, but yet the, this guy walking through a field, he sees this treasure. We're not told what it is, but it's just a treasure. Who knows what it is? It could have been put there by somebody else, or it could have been some type of natural uh, thing, you know, natural treasure or whatever. But he sees it, and he's so excited about it, he buries it again. Then he goes and sells everything so he can come back and buy that field so he can ha now he can legally have that trade because whatever's on the prop it's his property now, so whatever's there is his. You know, and, but it's, here is this idea that once he saw something, he knew it was worth a lot and he was willing to give it his all to go back and take possession of it. So the fourth thing I think we learn about the kingdom of heaven is that it is invaluable can't put a price on it it is invaluable it's worth selling everything for and going after and pursuing it's really the only thing that matters the kingdom of heaven letting people know that there's a better way of living than what they're seeing now there is a way forward there is hope there is um, you know all these kind of things. It's, in, it's something that is worth just selling everything you have. Closely related to that is the fifth one. And he says again, the king, verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for the pearls. He's searching again. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. So those two parables are kind of the same thing, right? Once you find it, you sell everything so you can possess it. And so it's invaluable, but then the fifth thing that we learn, I think, from that, from verses 45 and 46, is that not only is it invaluable, but it's, worth, it's worthy of searching for. It's worthy of spending your whole life looking after the kingdom of God. That, that's what I want to see. I didn't know that, but years ago when I was pastoring in Arkansas and I kind of went through this uh, phase where I was questioning God about what, what's the point of doing all this stuff. You know, it was a large church and all that. You know, what's the point of it all? And I felt God said, study the kingdom of God. You know, and so I went on this, went on this, this, this journey. And I remember I, I told God this when I, was, when I was praying all this stuff in my office. I said, Lord, I don't get it. The people in my church are good people. Even though they live in Arkansas, <laughs> they're good people. <laughs> they were good people before I got here. There'll be good people when I leave. And to be honest, God, if they did not even come to church, they would still be good people. But God, where are the miracles in the New Testament? Where is the drug addict, the alcoholic, the um, possessed, the prostitute, 
Where are those people? How come they're not responding to the gospel if it's good news? You see. And that put me on a journey that really, in, a, in, in one way, you could say ends up on death row. But I remember, this was several years ago, but I remember one time, um, you know, um, it was around Thanksgiving. And I, I remember one time there was a guy who used to come here and, and all that. And, and any time he was at church, I noticed in, in the offering there was a, just a really tight bundle of $20 bills. And it was usually two or $300 rolled up really, really tight in a bundle. Well, he was a drug dealer in the community. And would come to church and drop that money in the offering plate every time he was here. Now, nobody else, I mean, I'm sure some other people knew, but, I mean, I knew that, but we didn't, you know, welcome, you know, make a big deal about it. But then one Sunday before Thanksgiving, I think it was, when I got home and I went, you know, I, when I stand up here and look, I kind of take pictures, and when I get home, you know, I got a list, you know, I kind of, so I'll mark your name off today when I get home that you were here, you know. Um, and that's kind of, you know, keep it up. And so I was going through this list and went down this list, and we were, a little bit larger than we are now. When I was going, but on that one Sunday in our church, there were eight drug dealers that I knew of. There could have been more, but those were the ones I knew. And I was like, "Thank you, God. Thank you. This, this, this is where they are. And and some of them I know about now. And their lives have changed and all that. Some of them I've lost track with. But it was like, God, that's what I want to see. That's the kingdom of God, and it's worth searching for." I tell the staff in our other ministries, and I was, somebody was not on our staff, was talking to me the other day, and I told them this, you know, it's like, how do you do what you do? There's just so much, it's never, it's, you know, it's never over with, and da, 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 and people aren't grateful, and people abuse and use you, and, and all of that, and I said, well, here's the secret. Jesus healed 10 lepers. One said thank you. If Jesus, the Son of God, can get one out of ten, and he's perfect, then if I get one out of a hundred, I must be doing okay. And so you live for that one out of a hundred. That's the kingdom of God, and it's worth searching for. Giving your whole life to that one out of a hundred. That's what Jesus said. All right, so we got this so far. Let's go over them. The kingdom of God is now and not yet. Number two, the kingdom of God is bigger and broader than you realize. Number three, the kingdom of God is seemingly inaccurate, I mean, insignificant, but incredibly influential. Number four, the king kingdom of God is invaluable. Number five, it's worthy of searching for. But then look. Verse 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net. Now this is the one that sounds similar to the wheat and the weeds. The kingdom of God is like a net that was let down in the lake and caught all kinds of fish. That's how they fished in that day. You know, nowadays when people go fishing, they try to I'm going fishing for catfish, or I'm going fishing for bass, or I'm going to... But back in that day, it was just throw a big net out there, and whatever you caught, you caught. So it's like a net down, put down into a lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up to the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but they threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here is this parable. Kingdom of God. You just throw the net out there and whatever you gather, you gather as much of it as possible. You know, growing up in the time that I grew up as a pastor, kind of at the heart of the church growth movement, I went to seminars and I read books that all this stuff about you have to have your target audience. Who, who is your church trying to reach? 
So you got to have a target audience. And there's a church in Saddleback that kind of led this effort. And so they would say, you need like a Saddleback Sam where you describe, and a Saddleback Sally where you describe this is the, is it young families? Is it older adults? Is it college? Who is your target audience? And you know what? And, and I tried all that and everything. But it was really odd to me that in all the books and in all the um, seminars I attended, the target audience was always professionals. It was always wealthy families with children. Not one time did you read a book that said the target audience, the poor, the homeless, the homosexual. That's not the, we don't want them. If they come, great, but that's not our target. Our target is and here is Jesus saying the kingdom of God is not like that. You just cast that net out there, you get what, and then you let God work out the details. You let God, it's not our responsibility to separate the good from the bad. It's God's responsibility. And you know what? You don't, one reason you don't want to separate the good from the bad, because who knows when that day of separation comes, comes, comes to us, you may be in the bad pile. Right? We always think we're in the good pile when we read that verse. God's going to separate the good fish from the bad fish, and we automatically think we're the good fish. Some of us may be, I don't know, some of, we're the bad fish. And so it's not our job to do that. It's, that's why it's God's job. And here's kind of the lesson. The kingdom of God is inclusively Exclusive inclusively exclusive. In other words, all are welcome. And then we'll let God decide. But we welcome everyone. And then we let you know, God will work it out, not us. Inclusively exclusive. But then he continues. Verse 53. Let me skip something. It'll be weeping and ashing. I didn't read it. Weeping and ashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? Verse 51, Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. And I wrote this one down this morning as I was rereading of this. Here is Jesus. He looks at the disciples and said, You got this? You understand it? Good. Now go and tell other people about it is really what he's saying. Go and tell other people about it. And so the, king, the seventh thing then is the kingdom of God is meant to be shared, not kept to yourself. We're going to tell other people, look, there's another way of living. There's a better way of living. This is it. It's meant to be shared. But then look what happens in verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And the idea is he's teaching the same thing, probably just repeating these same parables. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this his mother? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Or aren't all his sisters with us? When did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. You see what's going on here? Jesus goes back to his hometown. He's teaching these same things to them. And people are like, who is this guy? He thinks he's somebody. Who does he think he is? He, he's not anybody. We, we remember him when he was young. He was a rascal. We know his mom. We know his dad. We know his brothers and sisters. Now, this is really odd because at first they liked his teachings, but then all of a sudden when they realized, wait a minute, who is this guy? Now they took offense at what he was saying. And Jesus said to them, this is near the end of verse 57, only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So here's kind of the eighth thing I think Jesus is telling us about the kingdom of God. Let's, let's rehearse. 
It's now and not yet. It's bigger and broader than you realize. It's seemingly insignificant, but incredibly influential. It is invaluable. It's worthy of searching for. It's inclusively exclusive. It's meant to be shared, not kept to yourself. But then the final point Jesus makes is that this kingdom of God is rejected by most. It's rejected by most. And notice who rejected it. It was the people who were in synagogue every Saturday. It was the people who were in church who were the most likely to reject this. Probably because it got at the system and the structures of things that they were used to. It was no longer beneficial to them. We're really going to do this? We're really going to put other people ahead of us? We're really going to um, serve and sacrifice and, and you, you're gonna, you, you really want me to give up everything and search after this no I take offense that's, a, that a, that's offensive now if we conclude where we started <laughs> the people who get the most offended when I talk about Christian nationalism are Christian and I'm like, no, you, you know, I'm, I'm, try, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm not trying that at all. I'm just trying to say, look, this is a dangerous path that we're headed down. Jesus, ne Jesus did not come to sit at the table. He came to overturn the table. He didn't want to place at the table. He wanted to overturn the table because it was oppressive and, and, and um, it was not treating people with fairness and equality. You see, that's the kingdom of God. It started the moment Jesus came, and it will continue through the efforts of those who follow him. But not, we don't build the kingdom of God like the world builds empires. That's not what we do. We don't force it down people's throat. It's like a little yeast works its way through the dough. That's what happens. And so our job as followers of Jesus, our job, our mission as a church is to um, bring the kingdom of God into the reality of, in the world in which we live. And that means in our homes and in our communities and schools where we work, in our nation and around the world. That, that's what we're called to do. But we do so through love, sacrificial service, forgiveness, housing the homeless, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, visiting the prisoner, visiting the sick. That's how you do it. Because it brings freedom and liberation to people, not more bondage. Let's pray. Father, once again, we just say thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, your word. And Lord, I pray that something has been said today that will just encourage us and challenge us to just keep following you. No matter what difficulties are out there, no matter what's going on, Lord, you have a job, you have a mission for us to do, and we all have an important part to play in that. Uh, so, Lord, show us the next step. Show us um, the path forward. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and say our prayer with the virtual services. We've only got a few more Sundays to say this together, then we'll have a new prayer. 2024 prayer but say this with me may the strength of God sustain us may the power of God preserve us may the hands of God protect us may the way of God direct us may the love of God go with us this day and forever in Jesus name amen you're dismissed <laughs>